this underway. Let's start. First of all, a quote for no reason whatsoever from someone who I really admire is Hilary Swank, the actress, and said that you only have one life. And if you're not doing it, what you love, well, what's the point? What we're going to look at today is how to identify your expertise and turn that into workshops and webinars and give you some structure and some essential tools that will help you along with that as well. And hopefully you'll have all the things you need by the end of this to do that. If you don't, I've got a great way for you to get some uh, extra help with that after this. This is brought to you by Business Station and the Digital Solutions Program, an Australian government initiative. And you can sign up for that or find out more information at businessstation.com.au. And YouTube, you can find this video both at uh, the Business Station channel after it's been recorded. We are live at the moment, though. And if you want to look up my own YouTube channel at Dante St. James, just my name, basically, uh, put that into YouTube and you'll be able to find me in there and see a couple of hundred different videos I've got on there, too. If you've not met me before, I work with Business Station with their digital solutions and uh, the entrepreneurship facilitators programs out of Darwin in the Northern Territory. Uh, as part of that, I've started up my own uh, pre-accelerator startup game called Startup Territory. I'm a certified lead trainer with Meta Australia. So I do quite a lot of traveling around Australia, teaching people how to use the, the Facebook and Instagram tools. Certified story brand guide. If you don't know what that is, it's okay. It just means I know how to do some marketing stuff. And there's a whole lot of other things I'm associated with there as well. I won't labor too long on that because we've got so much to cover today and I'm hoping that there will be enough in there that will help you to understand the importance of and how simple it can be for you to be doing webinars and workshops of your own. So when it comes to webinars, um, we saw a 441% increase in webinars in 2020, just as part of our program. Honestly, before 2020, before everything went pear-shaped, I found it hard to get anyone to get into a webinar. Everybody wanted to be in in-person workshops. But as soon as the pandemic hit, well, that all changed. Everyone was very keen to get into uh, to workshops that didn't involve people in person. And what we've found now in a lot of our strategic surveys is that up to 42% of people say they won't go back to in-person workshops because of the convenience of being able to participate with these online from wherever they are or whenever they are. And, and for instance, I, I could deliver this same workshop from uh, my own office, which I'm in. That's not the background. It's a fake background. I just like the sound, look at people working in the background. It makes me look busy important. Um, but I could be doing this from my parents' kitchen table, from a cafe even, uh, if I've got the right equipment with me and the right microphone to reduce the background noise, well, then I'm able to deliver this these almost anywhere. And that's the beauty of it for you. Tuesdays were found, <laughs> excuse me, even though it's Wednesday, Tuesdays were found is the best day to deliver these kind of things on. Now, when it comes to workshops, a little bit different. When 2020 hit, we had a 92% drop in interest in, um, in workshops. And even though we could still host workshops in the Northern Territory, and we didn't have quite the restrictions that the rest of Australia had, we still saw that nobody wanted to do it. Um, 2022, we're still at around about half of the 2019 level when it comes to in-person workshops. That's climbing every month as people get more, uh, a little bit more um, confident with meeting in person again. And after hours were found is the best time. So this time for me is after hours in Queensland is after hours for you, getting towards after hours in uh, Western Australia as well. But they are the best dependent times for me. Uh, whenever I run these things, I struggle to pull up and get people in the room uh, in a webinar or a workshop, but like during business hours, obviously, because you're working or you're in your own business. Uh, workshops, though, almost always perform best for me on a Saturday morning or after work at, say, 5 or 5 p.m. So that's uh, just a few insights, I guess, into the world of workshops and webinar that we've noticed as part of what we do here. Um, a difference, oh, great question, Sheree, a difference between a webinar webinar and a workshop. So a workshop, I say, is something that's due in person. So it's an in person in a room where you sit down at a desk and you're, and you're, and you're with the trainer in, in person. A webinar is something which is delivered like this. This is a webinar. Um, in Business Station, we, we have a bit different. We do have online workshops as well as in-person workshops. Uh, so a workshop generally will be about two hours in length, uh, whereas a webinar generally is no more than about an hour in length. And hopefully we make them quite a bit shorter. Some webinars, you just hear people rabbiting on and on and on and on and just think, you know, if you didn't rabbit on so much, we'd have this over and done within 15 minutes. So why do we do workshops? Why do we do webinars? Well, they simply develop authority and credibility. If you've got industry knowledge that you can share with people, that immediately connects you as an expert in what you do. 
you also have the specific expertise from what you do in your industry. So apart from you being maybe known in your industry or having industry knowledge, you've also got you know that day-to-day -day working in what you do. Let's just say, for instance, you're a swimming teacher. You're probably well placed to be able to do a workshop on how to train swimming teachers to be swimming teachers, um, aside from their qualifications through OSWIM and those kind of organizations and certification bodies. You could you might actually have your own particular technique that you want to sort of share out to others to do, and that can be free, it can be paid, anything like that. And one of the things I've found as somebody who works with Meta or Facebook here in Australia is that having someone in a room or on a webinar who they can actually see and listen to. And sometimes, yeah, it can be a matter of having the same accent as what they do, um, or at least an Australian accent, if you're here in Australia, is that you feel like there's a face to a big faceless company. It makes you feel a little bit more confident that you're dealing with people who may be able to understand where you're coming from or the cultural connection that you may have. Um, for instance, it's very hard for someone who is in America to imagine the, the humor that we use, or it could be hard for someone in, in say, um, Indonesia to deliver a workshop to Australians because there's very big cultural differences. So humor may not translate, and sometimes the words just aren't the same. Same thing for me. I, I, I wouldn't be very good at producing a webinar in Indonesia or America, for that matter, uh, because I I'm typically, I'm typically Australian. I slur my words and chop off the ends of my words, despite being quite well spoken. I still have that quintessential Australian accent, which for a a lot of people is very hard to understand. I really feel for people who come to us from another country and have to understand that our English is nothing like the English that they learned. It also helps you to build business relationships and a lot of brand awareness for your business because you've got time to build a connection, particularly in a workshop where you want, not so much one-to-one, -one, but you're in person, you're in front of people at a table, in front of them with a screen, presenting to them in person. It means you've got that time to build that connection. And you get to do things like exchanging their email address for your expertise, particularly when it can be, say, in a webinar. So you might say that, for instance, um, in order to be part of this webinar, like today, tonight's one that you're part of, you had to give us some details about your business. So that we can get paid basically by the government for reaching the appropriate kinds of people around the country. And then we look at adding a pathway after the event. What that simply means is that there's something that people can do with you or with your business or with your company after that event is over, after that webinar or that workshop is over, you've got a call to action for someone to take the next step. Now, that next step could be booking in a one-to-one -one, um, experience with you. It could be booking in to uh, buy something online and here's a discount code. Whatever that thing is, it's something which is meaningful to the client because it lets them go deeper. And it's meaningful to you because it usually involves you going from something which is free in the case of a webinar or a workshop, and they don't have to be free, but they usually are, uh, to something then that can, is potentially paid. So you can move people along what we call a sales funnel, um, going from you know, having a vague interest in what you're doing by being at your webinar or your workshop to a much closer one-to-one -one relationship that costs them money um, as they get much closer to converting to not just being a participant in a workshop, but being a client or a customer of your actual business makes a big difference. You also get a better understanding of who your target audience happens to be. You get to know the questions they have, the, the needs and the challenges and the problems they're trying to overcome. And then you can use your experience to tailor your services and products around what they're coming to you with. There's no better way to learn what people want than to ask them. And there's no better place to ask them than in a captive audience like this or in a workshop setting where you can literally just say to someone, hey, what are the problems you're having in your business when it comes to social media. Great. Okay. Fantastic. I now know because of the interactions I've had with literally thousands of people over the last few years in this program, that there's certain patterns that emerge, certain problems that people are trying to overcome and certain things they struggle with that I can build products and services and webinars and more workshops and one-to-one -one, um, prescriptive ways of getting things done around those things. So it comes down to the, I guess, the ability for you to have that deeper connection with people and really understand where they're coming from so that then you know that when they come to your products and services that you want them to pay for, you know how to promote those things. You know how to, to describe them. You know how to make them into something that's meaningful to them, not just a list of wants that you have. 
Workshops and webinars can be remarkably simple and easy and free to host even. Um, a, you can host a, a webinar or, or a Zoom call for free um, you know, for that 42 minutes. You don't have to have a one hour call. You can have a 42 minute one if you like. There's other platforms that allow you to do this for free. You can do it through social media, through Facebook, through Instagram, through LinkedIn, through YouTube. There's many ways you can run different workshops and webinars online. Um, webinars can then be recorded and you can repurpose them and reuse them somewhere else. So when you're able to do that, you're able to go, well, I do the work once and then I can put it out to multiple platforms after that. So what I usually do after these webinars is that I get the recording and I edit it and I put it up on my YouTube, which I then share out to my LinkedIn, my Facebook, uh, and then it's, it's on several places that people can get hold of it. So I can then have the option of having my expertise shared to a much bigger audience than just what, what happens to be in here today. And one of the things I love about webinars these days is that they don't have to have lots of fancy equipment. Now, I, I have some pretty good equipment. I do these every day, right? So I've got my Shure microphone, which is a, an expensive $450 microphone, but it makes a big difference to the quality of my recordings and makes it a lot easier for people to be able to hear and understand what I'm saying rather than having lots of echo. Now, I also have a sound reducing um, software on my computer. And what it does now, what you can't hear in the background here is that I've got coworkers actually talking in the background and they're not, they're not actually being quiet. They're, they're being at normal levels of talking and they're helping each other out but you can't hear that because i've got software on my computer that takes all that away it means that i can even go into a restaurant or a crowded place and you will not hear anybody else but my voice the ai in that software it's called crisp which is k-r-i-s-p it uh, works only on computers like macs and pcs at the moment not on phones it's it's amazing. It's so good at cutting out that background noise. It literally means that I can sit anywhere I like and do that. As long as I'm focused, it works. Um, some of the other equipment, I've got some uh, ring lights around me. So I've got three. Um, they cost me $30 each from Kmart. I just got them and ripped them off their stand and just stuck them on the wall. So I've got multi-directional lighting going on that helps me to look more bright and vibrant on the recordings as well. So all up my, my stack of things that I've got for this a 450 plus maybe another 90 so you're looking you know, just over 500 bucks i guess to be able to set up the setting i want with all this mic as in microphone um if the microphone is uh a sure microphone s-h-u-r-e so that's the one i use but i would say that this is a particularly expensive one you don't have to get that expensive a microphone the microphone can be um a blue yeti which is about 150 dollars and there's a nice little uh, samson one that i got for about uh, 59 dollars at jb hi-fi that it's one of my traveling ones that i take around with me so you don't have to use expensive stuff to do these with you can use cheaper stuff even the microphones that they sell for youtubing and, and live streaming at Kmart will do the job. They're actually remarkably good. What happens is the, the difference in price from something that costs $39 to $450 is quite marginal in reality. What it does for me is that I can just do more things with a re deeper, richer voice uh, for things like you know, voiceovers, and, and well, which I do quite a lot of, and, and the ability to be able to have that built-in sound reduction so that all the talk in the background isn't able to be heard by you through this microphone. Now, webinars and workshops, I've mentioned this before, the, the sales funnel. The sales funnel is about how you place yourself with these workshops and webinars. A workshop or a webinar on its own is not really has, it doesn't really have a lot of purpose. It doesn't really have a lot of ways for you to be able to go, oh yes, I need to be able to, um, I need to be able to uh, just do this workshop and people will buy my product. Without a sales funnel, without a plan with which to use your workshops and webinars as a lead magnet to get people to buy something more high value down the track, then, then it doesn't really make much sense. For example, in this program, our workshops and our webinars are a way for us to introduce you to ideas that you can then use us in a one-to-one -one capacity at that subsidized rate from the Australian government 
We want you to learn those things. So if you want to learn all about how to do webinars and workshops and all that, um, you could learn the basics from this one hour. And I'll take you through as much as I possibly can in an hour without getting too technical. And then what happens, you'll be then in a position to learn something more specific one-to-one. -one. When that one-to-one -one thing happens, that's when you learn the, the finer points. So the lead generation happens through this sales funnel. Starts at a, at a, a level called awareness. It goes through another level called consideration down to conversion. Now the registration of the uh, in in your workshop or your webinar, so someone registers to attend. That's what we call awareness and are aware of you and they're about to be informed more about you. Now, if they turn up to that webinar workshop, they move into the consideration part of that funnel, which we call middle of funnel. What they're doing now is they're not necessarily converted to be a customer of yours because they're not paying anything usually. They're just getting used to the idea of who you are, assessing your expertise and seeing if there's something they can learn from you or if they wish to work with you in the future. And then finally, at the end of it all, you have what is called the conversion, which what they can do is have a follow-up paid service at the end of your webinar. So a lot of these webinars and these um, and workshops will have a, a sales pitch at the end of them. And I've got a sales pitch of my own here, even though it's a, uh, it's a, <clears throat> It's a forty-four dollar program, and that's that's as much that's as expensive as we get. Uh, that's the that's the that's the sales pitch we do at the end. So, what is your sales pitch? Think about if you're going to do webinars and workshops, what's the point of them? Like, do you have a point to get someone to a deeper level of engagement with you? Do you have in there um, a way to get people to buy something from you at some point? Because when you do it gives you so much more meaning around what you're doing. A lot of people seem to have a problem with the idea. It's talking a lot means I have to drink a lot of water, sorry. Uh, it gets puts the idea in some people's heads that if I'm giving away all of my secrets and all my knowledge and expertise in a webinar or workshop, who's going to pay for it? I'll let you in on a little industry secret here. The people who, uh, who uh, want to get the free information from you they were never going to pay for you anyway. They were never going to come and pay for you. They never intended to pay anybody. In fact, if they found you by accident, what they did was they found you in amongst a search of other people and they kept searching until they found someone who was doing what they wanted for free. So what generally happens, we're looking for a how-to or a guide of how to do something. We go to YouTube and we look it up and see what we can find for free. Uh, then we might go, okay, well, I didn't really get much out of that because all they were doing was selling a product. Then you might go, okay, well, who's doing a webinar or a workshop that I might be able to attend? And that's the next stage. And then maybe you'll get those few people. So there might be one out of every webinar or two out of every webinar you run that are people who may want to go to that next step and go, you know what? You really know what you're doing. I'd really like to pay and work for you. And pretty much every webinar workshop I do tends to have people who I come to the end of that process and go, yeah, I want to do something more with you, whether it's a one-to-one -one as part of the digital solutions platform, or they'll approach me separately through something like LinkedIn and say, hey, what's your hourly rate? I'd like to work with you on my own, um, regardless of subsidies. So that's a very good sales funnel for you. Think about it as part of your process. The webinars and workshops are not the end. They're kind of the beginning. They're the start of it. So you've got to know what are the processes and the products you want to sell. A webinar could be the first step. An in-person or a private closed longer workshop could be the, the cheaper thing you do. If your webinars are free to give basic information, your paid workshop could be $20. And then after that, at the end of the paid workshop, you can offer one-to-one -one services at maybe $150 per hour each. So that way you've always leveling up as you go down the funnel to a more motivated customer, you're leveling up the kind of product or service you're offering to, um, in price so that you've got lots of people attending your free thing. And then as you go down the funnel, you've got a few people who drop out the end. Cause I don't know about you, but I can't work with a hundred people all at once, one-to-one. -one. It would drive me insane. There's about a hundred people a month that I do work with one-to-one -one through this program. And to tell you that's exhausting. That's a lot of work. So you don't want to be over, you don't want to be overselling your space. So once you decide you want to do this, you've got to find out what it is you're actually an expert in. What are the things that you do and know that make you a little bit different to everybody else and give you the right, I guess, to get in front of people and talk to them. Now, one of the first things you'll have to overcome as this whole expert thing is the tendency for us to often think of ourselves as imposters. There's actually a syndrome associated with this called imposter syndrome. And it's where, for instance, there's that little voice in your head 
that's telling you, oh, who do you think you are? Who the hell do you think you are standing up in front of people and talking to them about this? You're nothing. You don't know anything. You don't even have a university degree. I'm here to tell you right now that little voice is just there to protect you. The little voice just is scared of you being embarrassed and somebody saying something bad about you. The little voice isn't to be hated but you need to move past the little voice to get there. I used to be the same way. I used to think, who the hell am I to be producing these things in front of people? And then one day when I was being very, very um, disingenuously, dis, uh, I guess, um, humble, I, I call it false modesty. I was being very modest about what my background is. Someone in there called out and said, mate, you've got nothing to worry about. You've got how many university degrees, how many certifications, how many years you've been doing this. And it turns out I ended up being like one of the most qualified and experienced people in this in Australia in combination. And that was like a wake up call when somebody who I thought was very qualified for this tell, talked to me and said, dude, you're like three times more qualified than me it knocked sense into me. And you may have to have someone in your life who knocks a little bit of sense into you to make sure you work past that imposter syndrome and realize that you are an expert. You just have to know what your expert expertise is. So we ask these questions in order to find out what our expertise or speciality is. So if our specialty is in a particular kind of um, niche of the industry we're in, or if there's something we've been doing for many years, we could go, well, that may be the thing that I might be an expert in. So what is your professional expertise? You ask yourself, what are you qualified in? You go, well, I'm not really qualified in anything, but I've done something for a long time. That's just as important. Experience on the job, on the tools is equally as important of any qualifications you've had. Just because you don't have a university degree in what you're about to teach doesn't mean you're not an expert. 25 years of doing it every day of your working life, as opposed to what, three years in a university, it far exceeds what the university qualification is. And then you look at those things, you go, well, what am I known to be an expert as? What do people come to me and ask me about um, when, when they need help? People ask me for help for something all the time. What is that thing? And would that make me an expert? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. You are an expert if other people ask you for your opinion or for your help with achieving those tasks. See, it doesn't actually take a lot to be an expert. It takes either qualifications or experience. And if you've got both of those, you're one of those rare unicorns that is a qualified and experienced person who is definitely an expert. And if you're someone who's got the gift of the gab, like I clearly do, hopefully you have a bit of the gift of the gab as well. You, you're able to talk in front of people without too much concern. Well, then what you've got is the ability to really change the world, change people's lives and add some real value to what they're doing in their businesses and their lives. So I can look at what my stuff is, right? Okay. My professional expertise examples will be something like I've got a master's in business information systems from University of New South Wales. I've never really used the information I learned from that, but it sounds like it's related to technical stuff. So it, it sounds related. Enough. I've also been in marketing related work since 1999 when I first got on a radio station on the Gold Coast. So that was, you know, I've, I've got the I've got the runs on the board of years behind me, and I'm particularly well known in the community now across Australia in in uh, in terms of. Um, the social media and digital marketing community, because of my affiliation with and contract with Meta or Facebook, I'm now known for my social media marketing mouse, which means I can quite simply say, yes, I'm definitely an expert in that. But any one of those things would still mark me as an expert. I wouldn't have to have all three. I could have the masters and I could be an expert. I could have had the experience and I'd be the expert. I could have the contract with Facebook and be the expert in the room. So you don't have to have all those things. There's no pressure for you to be a ridiculous level of them. And then we want to sort of identify your industry expertise or specialty. And this is where we go, well, what makes you an expert in your industry? Um, identifying what industry you're in. Are you in beauty? Are you in professional services, business services, legal? Um, are you, do you own a gym? Are you working in a um, in a uh, an arts facility? Are you working in an NDIS uh, um, a provider, 
all those different things. You go, am I in that industry? And then you look for what the niche is in that industry that you're well known for. Are you a gym that specializes in Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Or are you a gym that's more about uh, weightlifting and 24-hour access? Or if in the case you are an NDIS provider, then are you um, doing mostly case management or are you actually providing the therapies there as well? So physical therapies, occupational therapy, speech pathology, any of those kind of things as well. And then asking yourself, is your business in that industry or does it serve that industry? I can speak to the tourism industry quite easily in multiple markets around Australia because I'm either affiliated with them, work with them, work alongside them, or do something with them as a supplier. Um, but I'm not in that industry. I'm actually in the internet industry. So I work with social media and digital marketing and system, business systems, all that kind of thing. So I work with that other industry. I could be seen as an expert in tourism systems, tourism booking systems, for instance. So you don't have to be just an expert in what you do. You can be an expert in providing what you do to specific industries. You're, so it's like saying, for instance, whilst I'm known as somebody in the internet industry, I'm actually specifically known for my work with the tourism industry and especially in providing support and installation of booking systems for hotels and for tour operators. And that's something which is an industry expertise that goes beyond just, I am an expert in what I do in my industry. You can say, I'm an, I'm an expert to them. I'm also something of an expert with people who are life coaches and um, physical therapists as well, because I've worked with so damn many of them. So I can say that, yes, I work in the internet industry, but I work specifically with um, NDIS providers to help them to better identify what their points of difference are and to create the right online tools for them. So there you have, that 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 specific you can go into and for everything on the internet these days there's a crowd for every kind of niche there is you could be someone who works with comic book stores to help them to do better online sell better online sales you could be someone who works specifically with real estate agents to help them to better position their properties and take better photos of their properties for putting on instagram there's always going to be a, an audience for you now, sometimes that audience won't be huge. We haven't got a huge audience in here tonight, but we will reach a huge audience on YouTube after the fact. We'll reach hundreds and thousands of people will see this video and learn from it. So you don't have to have a big industry in there. Remember, you may have, may, may have 10 people in a workshop, but if only one of those people converts to being a customer, then your pricing will be in such a way that that one customer will make it all that worthwhile. Because after all, you can't take on endless clients, can you? So here's some examples of some industry expertise. So you're a certified practicing accountant with 25 years servicing tourism businesses. Um, I actually know someone who's a CPA um, and, and is exactly that. They've served tourism businesses specifically for 25 years. They're an expert in that area. Or you're a digital marketer who works mostly with tradies. I know two digital marketers in regional Australia who fit that description perfectly. They work mostly with carpenters, plumbers, electricians, electricians, tradies, builders, that, those kind of guys. Or you could be a fragrance maker who works only with organic and vegan ingredients. Now that's pretty niche, right? But imagine if you're talking to people who work with essential oils, make their own essential oils, they are in the vegan and organic areas, and they want to talk to someone who helps them make better fragrances, that's you. You're going to have a crowd of people ready to do that, particularly if they're not wanting to join in on one of those dodgy network marketing essential oil schemes. They probably want to make their own essential oils, and you've got the way to do that. You're a fragrance maker who works with all those ingredients that they want to work with. They don't know what they're doing but you do, you've got something to show them, something to teach them. And you may even have a paid product you can sell them as well. In the case of the organic and vegan ingredients fragrances, you may have a selection of concentrates that you can sell them or an in-person workshop where you actually teach them how to do that. I go to baking classes because, you know, why not? Um, someone there has expertise and they're very, very good at showing you how to bake. So I baked my first loaf of sourdough bread. It was absolutely delicious. And in a couple of weeks time, I'm going to be baking a pull apart and making French biscuits because why not? You can sell that kind of expertise if you have the expertise to do it. Food industries, of course, you may have to look at um, food safety regulations around that. You can't just do it in any old kitchen. 
Another way to do this is to identify your geographic market, to look at some of the places where you could potentially um, target your, your webinars towards. And this will come through your affinity, I guess, with that target or your desire to get into that market in particular. So let's just say you're looking at a geographic market like um, you, you might be very, very much someone who's in Tasmania and your expertise is very much limited to um, organic farming in Northern Tasmania. And so what you do is you run constant workshops with other Tasmanian prospective hobby farmers who have moved in from interstate and they wanna start some small scale commercial um, organic farming in Northern Tasmania, then you would be the person to talk to them. Now that particular webinar would probably not be useful to someone living in North Queensland or Northwest WA, or even in another country because the climate's different, the soils are different, the conditions are different. So you'd have different things to consider. Um, so in that case, your geographic market is probably going to be Northern Tasmania, or at least people who are looking to move to Northern Tasmania to start their, their new farms. But you may have an expertise that crosses borders. So your expertise may be something to do with um, arts and crafts. You want to show people how to make their own their own um, natural colored paints. And so you can teach them with the rocks and the plants that come from the area that they are in to turn those into inks and paint colors. Or your expertise could be fitness. And your fitness could be you, you want to do classes that do cross borders. So again, that Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I will talk about that. So we'll look at something like capoeira or, or Brazilian jiu-jitsu and say, well, if you want to do those things and teach them overseas, you, it's the same everywhere you go. It's not like there's um, specific ways of teaching that are only um, going to be happening in, in Southeast Queensland or in Perth. Those teachings cross borders and go everywhere. I've just had a, a problem with my, um, with my uh, slides. I'll just get those started again. Might be a second. Sometimes Canva just, just loves to just test you. Let me get that shared again and presented. So you know now where I do my, um, where I do my workshops, they're all done through Canva. Let's go a bit further. And now we get on to back to our slide that we we're on, geographic market. So the other thing to look is to, do you have a natural connection with another state or country? Do you have a, an affinity with a, a language grouping? You may speak um, Swahili and want to talk to people who speak Swahili in South Africa. You may speak Lao and you want to deal mostly with people who also speak the Lao language. Or you might be from India and speak uh, Tamil and you want to deal specifically with people who are Tamil because you speak Tamil as well. All those abilities help you to cross borders to not just speak with people who speak Tamil or Swahili or Lao here in Australia, but people who speak those languages in those native countries where they're from. And that really opens up the world for you. It opens up a massive lot of opportunities that let you, I guess, understand that you can, you can connect your expertise and present your expertise almost anywhere in the, in the world. Now, geographic market examples for this may be that you once lived in or worked in a particular town or city. So you can provide an outsider's view of restaurants that you must visit next time you're in Sydney. And I could probably do that. I could probably do a review of half the restaurants on uh, King Street of Newtown in Sydney because I've been to so many of them over the years. So I can tell you that this particular burger joint, go to this one, but not that one. If you want to go get gelato, get it at this place, not that one. The coffee, get it at this little hole in the wall rather than that main chain down there because it's going to be a whole lot better. Or you may be... You may be a Korean and you can deliver your workshops in the Korean language. That would be a massive uh, thing for you if you're able to reach the Korean community in Australia, but also speak to people in South Korea who have uh, an area of interest that, that collides with what your area of expertise is. Or your art technique is not limited to a specific country. We're talking about making inks and paints before out of natural, uh, natural ingredients. Well, that doesn't require you be in any specific place because you can extract color from minerals and from plants from anywhere in the world. You just tell them, bring three flowers from your garden, bring three rocks from your garden, and we're going to make colors out of those. And it doesn't have to be anything in particular, just what they've been able to find in their backyards. 
And then we go into your experiential expertise. And this is just a fancy way of saying, what have you spent a lot of time learning and doing in your life and career? And this is all about understanding whether your expertise is from study or whether your expertise is from experience or whether it's from both. And that's what we were saying before. You don't have to have both, but it can be helpful, but you can still have just the expertise from having studied it or the expertise from having worked in it. Ask yourself, what is something that is closely related to your business that you're an expert in? So it may not be in your business. It may be closely related to your business, but you're an expert in that thing. Or you may have something that's completely outside of your business. Your business may be to provide um, after hospital care and, and occupational therapy services as part of an NDIS provider. But your own specific personal thing expertise is in Star Trek and this is one that's close to me because I am probably a, a bit of an expert at Star Trek. I've watched a lot of it. I follow a lot of the um, the books and the comics and the, all the different things that are in that Star Trek universe. And I could talk for a long time with great expertise and great experience about the Star Trek universe. But that's not part of my business. My business is in digital marketing. So you don't have to build something that's just around your business. It can be around your passion about the things you love, your hobbies. And then think about it. Are you known for a specific particular expertise? Do people come to you all the time in your life and go, oh my God, you need to show me how do you arrange those flowers? Your flowers always look magnificent. You go, that's someone telling you that they see you as an expert in arranging flowers, you as an expert in folding hospital corners on sheets, you as an expert in cleaning, you as an expert in gardening any of those things that you have a passion for, you can build workshops and webinars around as well. Yes, there's lots of people already out there doing that, but they're not you. They don't have your very specific set of examples and specific sets of experience to be able to bring to the table. So there's a few uh, examples of experiential expertise will be that you've never studied in marketing, but you have worked in it for 12 years. I'd call you an expert. You're a plumber, but you're also a cinematic drone pilot. That's pretty cool. Like you might be a plumber and you're an expert, expert in that, but you're also an expert in drone piloting. You can teach people techniques and how to drone, uh, how, to, how to pilot drones as well. You might be a bookkeeper. You're also an expert in teaching MYOB or my, uh, MYOB. So if you're, an expert, if you're a bookkeeper, you're already an expert in money and in and, and the way that financial thing, systems move, but you're also an ex expert in being able to teach other people how to use one of the major Australian systems for managing money. So you don't have to be necessarily do it. You just have to claim your expertise. You don't have to be already known as expert because you can make that. When I first started in this, I was not known as an expert. Even though I was, I had the information, I had the training, I had the education. I didn't have any claim to expertise. So what you need to do is claim that expertise. And you do that by sitting down and working out, well, how long have you been doing this for? Is it long enough to consider yourself an expert? If it's anything more than five years in most areas, yes, you probably are. If it's 10 or 20 years, you are a hyper expert. You're a very much an expert and you should be very proud to call yourself that. Then think about how successful you've been. Have you won awards for this? Have you been recognized by other people for being an expert? Um, do you have a business out of this that's been quite successful? That makes you an expert. Have you tried many other ways of getting to where you are now? Perhaps you've even failed in business in some ways, get back up on your feet and rebuilt your business from the ground up. You would then be an expert in what you do. I was speaking with a, a wedding planner the other day and she um, nearly lost her business about five years ago. And they really just doubled down on doing the fundamentals right, getting their finances right, getting themselves into a position where they weren't paying two times more than what they needed to be paying for their rent. And they, they got through it. And so what she now has the capability of doing is looking at other wedding planners and helping them to build viable businesses. Rather than just being a wedding planner, she can now be a wedding planner who teaches other wedding planners how to be wedding planners by focusing on the fundamentals of good business growth and then how to ensure that you've got all the right things in place to win those contracts for being a wedding planner. Examples of some of all this might be that you've been baking wedding cakes for 27 years. You might have tried three different types of training before you found a particular kind of training that worked for you in the gym. You might have failed at business and learned the lesson and then turned it all around and succeeded. 
All of these things give you experiential expertise that you can build your things around. So how do we then establish that expertise and make it grow into something we can sell? You need to establish what is called social credibility. And social credibility is simply linking together who you've worked with, and you can do that through LinkedIn, what degrees or qualifications you might have gained along the way, and any sort of examples you can provide from that give what we call social proof or social credibility from other people's sources. That could be through things like reviews and recommendations. It could be the fact that you were seen on a te television um, spot or a radio interview or interviewed in a magazine or you've been in a newspaper or even being featured in somebody else's blog. In all those cases, you have credibility because it's not you saying how good you are. It's other people calling on your credibility and them telling you how good you are. That's pretty powerful. When other people will publicly call you out for what you do, then it's good. Then that's great. Um, that's very powerful stuff. It's called social proof. And it's something that you should look up because uh, having that sort of social proof through recommendations, reviews, interviews, uh, articles written about you, all that sort of thing are so powerful because they add not just some um, credibility to people to think that you're better than, than what you thought you were, but it also provides credibility in Google searches. The more of those kind of references you have from other people elsewhere, the more that Google will ramp up your rankings. Now, examples of social credibility can include the fact that you've worked with three government programs and five national brands over the last five years. That's credibility. You have a diploma in landscape gardening. Well, you've certainly got more credibility in landscape gardening than someone that hasn't got that diploma. You have a regular guest interview spot on radio in your, your town. That's a great thing to have as well, because I can tell you now that there's not going to be very many other people who do what you do who have that kind of access to an audience or that kind of access to a credible media source. And now you confirm your expertise with people. So you confirm it by understanding that you have an opinion about the future of your industry. So for instance, you might decide to write a blog that um, has quite strong opinions about something, that you've got an opinion about this happening in your industry or that happening in your industry, why organic is better than non-organic or why you believe that organic is a scam. Um, you've got opinions that you can back up with research, science, and very logical, reasonable thought. Then that sort of stuff does make you a citable um, expert. I write a blog. I've had well over 300 episodes of that blog, well over 200 episodes of my podcast, 300 uh, articles on my, on my website's blog. So I've got a certain credibility and a certain level of experience and expertise in a lot of areas that I write about. Um, you might have taken on leadership roles in your market or in your industry. You might have become the chairman or chairperson of the, of the local uh, chamber of commerce or of your industry association. Those things confirm your expertise. You're not just good at what you do. You're regarded to be one of the best and your peers also agree that that's the case. So you've got all this credibility. You've got all this building of expertise and what. So how do you turn all this into a business? Turning into a business is the challenge because you ultimately need to make money, right? So you do it through in-person workshops, live video or webinars, and online courses. Now, these things can sit in very different orders. I'm going to start off with the in-person workshop. An in-person workshop is powerful for giving you that credibility simply because it allows you more personal and intimate time with your participants. You get time to talk to them, interact with them, watch their body language, understand what makes them tick. And they, in turn, get better access to you, who's the expert. They want to be in that room because they want to be associated with you. They want to ask you the questions. They want to understand what the wisdom is that's coming from you, the guru, to them, the novice. And because of that personal and very intimate relationship you'll have with people in the same room, there's a high rate of conversion when people go from that free webinar or workshop um, where they've actually come to see you in person to becoming a client because they know who you are. Now, whilst they might not all convert at the end of the webinar because they might feel a bit embarrassed walking straight up to you after that, after that workshop or something, they're much more likely to because they're now much more uh, connected with you. There's a, um, it comes up a lot lately. I learned it from a guy called Nathaniel Liddy, which, um, Libby, who's a, a LinkedIn expert out of Perth in WA. Nathaniel Bibby, sorry is his name. Um, Nathaniel, uh, introduced me to the, the idea of um, the phenomenon of 
the mere exposure effect, mere exposure, M um, E R E exposure effect. What it is, is that the more people see you, the more people notice you, the more they come up on their feeds and all that sort of thing, the more they think of you as an expert, the more they want to work with you. And if they lined up 15 people against the wall who do what you do, they would pick you every time because they're familiar with you. They know your approach. They know your work. They've seen you. And just by being merely exposed to you and having seen you, you then become the most trusted of the experts in that lineup. That's why you get that high rate of conversion because they've been exposed to you for the last one and a half to two hours in that workshop. They know what you're capable of. They know that you can articulate what it is you're an expert at and you've been able to answer their questions along the way. So you've got them to a point where they're ready to start spending money with you. The live video webinar is a little bit different. More people can attend it, that's for sure, because it can be anywhere across any nation or set of nations or continents. It can even be automated. I could have come tonight and have pre-recorded this and set it off as an automated play up, uh, playback um, with all my problems and all my mistakes beeped out and or cut out and edited. And it would have been a perfect experience, but it probably wouldn't have had that same level of interaction where you can ask a question and I'm right there to answer it at the time through here, not through chat. Now, the problem with a webinar or a video is that you have turnout problems. Now, for instance, we had a certain amount of people who booked for this webinar tonight and about a sixth of the people who booked actually turned up. Um, that's, a, that's an issue we've got across all of our webinars and workshops at Business Station. A lot of people register for them. Not a lot of people turn up for them for various reasons. Life happens. You know, you can go, oh, just at five o'clock in the afternoon, do I really want to learn something? Six o'clock in the afternoon, do I really want to learn something? I just want to go home and watch television. I get that. The other thing is too, we present these on YouTube after the fact. So it allows you then to watch it in another format anyway. Um, but the problem with the low, low turnout means a low conversion as well. And whereas in a workshop where people are actually in the room with you, it's much more likely they'll sign up for something or the next step because they're right there and it's easy for them to do that. And they can ask questions and seek reassurance about the product or the service right there in front of you. When it's a webinar, you don't have that luxury. It's not quite the same. You don't get that opportunity to ask the questions as much um, because you're either in a rush or they're wrapping up the webinar and there's no time to ask questions. So the answer to that might be an online course. And this has been a lot of people doing courses. The problem is that you say you're doing a course and everyone's just like rolls their eyes and go, oh yeah, another online course. Yep, we'll see how that goes. Less than 5% of people who produce courses ever make any money out of them. And less than 1% of people who make courses make enough money to live on. It's about the same as working in a network marketing organization, selling powders, potions, and pills. Um, it's less than 1% of people ever succeed at making a living income out of a network marketing scheme in the same way that you'll do the same with an online course. It's a very low success rate, but what it can be is something which helps you to put across your, your, your story, your themes, your expertise in a way that doesn't require you to be there 24 seven to answer those questions and you can charge for access to it. If it's specific information that involves processes and how-tos that you are providing that maybe nobody else is or others who are, you've got a better way to do it, then charge for it. These courses though do have a low rate of completion because they're usually very basic and someone goes, oh, I've already done all this stuff before, or they're too extremely um, um, technical and that makes it very hard for people to feel like they can finish it because it seems like impossible to overcome. So we're going to focus in on this in this last uh, 12 minutes of our webinar to look at how you can create your workshops and webinars. And one of the most important ways to look at it is that, that, that how do you do it? Like an in-person workshop, how do you do that? You can book a meeting room. Um, you can book in a co-working space, churches, community centers, local member of parliaments, offices, and shared spaces. And then you set up your ticketing on things like Eventbrite and Humanitics. You can also set up uh, ticketing on Facebook, but then not everybody's on Facebook. Most people are, but not everybody is. So sometimes we will divert to things like Eventbrite, Sticky Tickets, and Humanitics, which is my favorite. It's an Australian company that donates all the booking fees to projects, um, to developing um, 
girl students in developing countries and also for scholarships for Indigenous Australians in regional areas to attend educational institutions in the cities. So they do some really good work. They're a not-for-profit and they're an Australian startup and they're doing great, great work. And you can advertise on Facebook or LinkedIn and get people interested in what you're doing. Advertising on Facebook and LinkedIn can be as little as $20 on a boosted post to send out to people in your area to attend your in-person workshop. What I find though, the biggest cost of in-person workshops is the venues, which I say probably work with local members of, of, uh, members of um, parliament's offices, libraries, anywhere you can get a room that's essentially either free or very low cost because trying to get rooms and things like hotels, function centers, and a lot of co-working spaces can be very expensive and not particularly good. Um, if you're doing live videos or webinars, it can be done on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Zoom, Teams, any of those things can be used to produce a live webinar or video that goes out to people. Again, you're ticketing on things like Eventbrite and Humanitix, using ads on Facebook and LinkedIn and elsewhere to get the word out there. I don't advertise any of my things on LinkedIn by payment. I just create an event on LinkedIn and invite my thousands of people who follow me to be able to come along to that. Now I've got a big list of people now. It's easy for me to fill an event in my hometown. Not so easy for me to fill an event where I don't have a lot of followers. So just bear in mind, if you're going to try and do this organically, making sure the people that you want to have there are represented in your following um, on whatever social media channel you're going to be using. Your online courses, you can use things like Teachable, Udemy, GuruCan, Kajabi, Thinkific, Udemy, any of those sort of, um, yeah, any of those uh, online course hosting platforms will be fine. Some of them are cheaper than others. Some are very expensive, like Kajabi and Thinkific can be very expensive as well. Same thing, you promote it on Facebook, you promote it on Instagram and YouTube, you sell it, you tell the people who have been in your, in your webinars that you've got an online course, you provide them with discount codes to do it. It's, it's all very, very... Um, much about what you are more comfortable promoting on. Sharice is asking now on the how-to question, how to write and lay out the content and timing of the workshop and course. Very good question. I've actually got a bit of a, a structure right now. It's the very next point we're going to make. And it's all about what I call the rule of three. And I think the rule of three, and it's a pattern you would have seen in my presentation tonight. And I try to hold to this for everything I try to teach. The reality is that people as humans, we struggle to retain any more than three key ideas during any lesson. So when you go to university uh, tutorials and lectures, when you go to classrooms and kids are struggling to learn and retain information because we just can't take everything in. We take in a quote total, I think of um, 34 gigabytes of information every day that we can recall and store. The problem is though, that we really only recall probably about three to four gigabytes of that that we can put in what our, our random access memory is. And that means that most of the stuff that you're going to hear from tonight and from any of the other lectures or any other lessons you're going to go to, you're not going to take home much, much of that. That's what notes are for. That's what, you know, being able to get recordings of this is for taking screenshots of the, of the, of the, of the slides is helpful for because you can only take in so much. So I help that out by providing the idea of three by three. So there's only ever going to be three main ideas, three main ideas for the whole one hour. And in that one hour, I say, you're going to learn about three major things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to um, the, um, the slide at the very beginning, which was our what we're going to do and what we're going to learn today. So you'll notice that I did this. What we look at today had three points. Now we've learned a bit more than that, but I didn't want to overwhelm you. I thought if, if, we, if I put on there a list of everything you may learn from this, this today, you would be overwhelmed. So I said, let's just make it three things. How to identify your expertise, how to turn that into workshops and webinars and the structure and essential tools you need to deliver it. That's a lot less hard to do. And then you'll notice on my other screens that where I've got options and things, they're on three. So three, three, three three, three, three. Everything I do is in threes. And the reason for that is because I know that that's not, that's the only way that people can take things in. They have to follow that rule of three. Again, because we can only take in so much and we only tend to be able to take in up to three ideas or three points at any one time. So that rule of three is very, very important. Remember that we can only deal with three key ideas during a lesson and we can only take in three 
points on a screen. So three main ideas that you'll carry through your one hour or two hour um, workshop or webinar, and then three points per slide. Do not go on and on and put all the writing on there. Remember your slides are just prompts for the words you're going to say out loud. So I'll say that again, your slides, the information on there is just the prompts for what you're actually talking about live and out loud. So you don't have to put every word you're going to say in there. In fact, it's ridiculous. There's another theory too, and this is a bit of extra. I don't have a slide for this, but um, it's from a guy called um, Guy, guy uh, Kawasaki, who's quite speaker from japan and i think it's actually from hawaii but it's japanese background and his whole theory is that you basically have no more than 20 slides uh 10 slides 20 minutes and no more than um no less than 30 point font so 30 point font is the smallest font you should have on a screen now that all my fonts are really big Everything on my words are really big. I don't have a lot of words on there. I try to have as few words as I possibly can. Um, I've taken my 30 point font rule up to about 45. So it makes it easier for you to be able to read things. So that when you've got those three points per slide, they're short, they're sharp, they're memorable, they make sense. I'm not going to be reading them straight off the screen. I'm describing them. Uh, the points that are on the screen are more just prompts for you to take that lesson in. So you need to swallowing that water now because I talk so much. Now, the essential tools you'll be looking for as part of this, a whiteboard will help you to describe questions, to write down questions that people ask. A display screen or projector is very good for large spaces, but you may not need that. If you're in a small place, you might just be able to, to plug into a big screen TV. You'll need access to power, access to toilets, tea, coffee, water, accessibility for wheelchairs, that kind of thing. Notes, note paper and pens are all part of what you're doing with an in-person workshop. But if you're doing a live webinar, your requirements are much less, but there's certain things you do need. A damn good broadband internet connection. I've got a really good one here because I, it's my, my money, my pay. You need backup internet on the phone. So you got to make sure that if the internet on your landline runs out, then you've got one on your phone that you can fall back on. Bright background or location. Um, I've got that, the background of uh, people apparently working in the background. It's a fake one. Uh, but I've also got bright ring lights around me. So it actually makes it easy to see me. Uh, for people who are um, hearing impaired, makes it easy for them to lip read. You don't tend, I don't tend to cover my face like this. Um, I tend to keep my face very open and use gesticulation with my hands to be able to present with. You'll have a fast, reliable computer is very, very important and knowing your systems. And I find a good microphone is even more important than a good camera. The reason is because people can forgive a blurry feature, but they will not forgive an unclear voice that keeps breaking up on them. For your online courses, again, pretty much all the same things, good cameras, good microphones, all your slides and notes, your questions and answers, assessments, upsells, all those things, all set up, ready to go. This is not really covering the online course side of it, but what we'll do is a recap as we close. What you've got to do is work out what your expertise is. It may not be a work thing. It could be a fun thing. Establish and then confirm what your expertise is online so people can then verify that elsewhere that you are actually a you search my name Dante St. James on Google and you'll see citations all over the internet of what I've done and who I've worked with and all that um, that's credibility that you get and it doesn't take that long to build up really find your platform or your business model so your platform might be webinars and then you go well I'm going to do them through Zoom or I'm going to do them through um, a training platform like Kajabi and then have the right tools and systems in place so you can deliver that really sharp three rules of three um, uh, structure in a really easy way. So remember that that structure was three big questions that you're answering during the webinar or your workshop, three big ideas. And then on each screen, don't have any more than three points and making sure that your font is 30 or more in size. You do not want little fonts that nobody can read on screen because we don't know how many people are watching them on these small screens and mobile phones and how many people are watching them on big screens like I've got in front of me here in my office. I'd like to thank you for taking some time out of your day to join me and work on your business together. Um, you can reach out to me and have a chat to me through Dante at businessstation.com.au. 
Uh, LinkedIn is a very good place to get hold of me. I do invite you to connect with me or follow me there. Send me a message and we'll have a chat about it, whatever you want to have a chat about when it comes to the systems in there. Um, learning management systems that uh, Nokalutha, Nokalutha is asking for um, is uh, they've got like the really old ones like Moodle, but honestly, I don't think they're very good. I, I tend to use things like um, Coassemble, I think is an excellent Australian made um, learning program, Coassemble it's called, as in co and then assemble. Um, another one that I found is quite good is called New Zenler. So new, the word new, and then Zenler, which is Z-E-N-L-E-R, is, is a bit of a learning management system. Uh, and another one that's um, been quite good for me to practice on too is called, well, Thinkific. I, th I had a few on the slide before, Thinkific, Teachable, is also another one. Teachable is a very, very popular one, actually. Um, and Udemy, Udemy, U-D-E-M-Y. -E uh, Udemy is a very popular one, but it's a bit of a marketplace. And I don't like the way that they work with your courses. They could at any time decide that they want to give away your course for free for a week. And you get 30 people join up and they're all not paying you anything. So I, I tend to steer away from Udemy, but Teachable, I think is very good. Think Ific is also very good. New Zenla, Guru Can, G U R U C A N, all very good. Or you can check out a, 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 a website called AppSumo, A P P S U M O. They always seem to have a learning management system on a lifetime deal. In other words, you pay $79 once and you never pay for it again. Uh, they're always awesome. Just watch for the small print in your learning management systems that they do let you save your videos in the system and not. They don't um, force you to buy extra space for videos or store your videos in other places. You want to make sure you can actually do that. And the app that I was talking about, yes, with the um, with the sound reduction, uh, is called Crisp. So it's K R I S P. That's the one. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's been an awesome time having you here. If you see this on uh, on YouTube, please like, share, subscribe, leave us some comments below and hit the bell notifier too. So you'll be able to get all the new uh, editions of stuff from Business Station and myself in your feed. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Goodbye.